Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for the gift of music, heavenly music. Lord, we pray that you would put a song in our hearts. You would encourage us with the wonderful hope that we have that one day, not only will we sing a new song, but we will join the choir of heaven. Lord, encourage us where each one are going through trials and challenges Encourage us that you are near to us, that you have not left us. We pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to extend a warm welcome to each of the visitors. I'm glad that you're here today and the members as well. It's good to be here with you. Uh, I see Craig back. Craig, it's good to see you. Yeah. I see some other new faces. Good to have you here today. I'm going to be preaching today on the subject of the Holy Spirit. Um, The title of the sermon today is Pray for Rain. Now, here in Huntsville, I recognize that we get plenty of rain, especially in the winter months. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, and, you know, we're in a similar trajectory for the jet stream, right? But for whatever reason, Atlanta does not get the precipitation that Huntsville does, never has, at least that I know of. And um, I remember growing up in Atlanta, and me and my brother played baseball, um, well, uh, for lack of a better term, religiously. We would play baseball to such an extent that we had a code system where if the other person was teasing or joking around, if we really wanted them to tell the truth, we would get them to swear on Dale Murphy's honor. I think I shared with you before, another congregation. But, and, and we grew up like this where baseball was our life. And, and if we told jokes or something, you would stop it. You would kind of pal around for a while and they'd be like, do you really mean that on Dale Murphy's honor? That was my brother's. I was Daryl Strawberry. If he said you swear on Doc Gooden or Daryl Strawberry's honor, but all right. Um, I tell you that to tell you this. I remember growing up in Atlanta that we lived in the suburbs up in Kennesaw and Marietta, and Dad would always have the yard looking really nice. Now, those of you who like yards and working outdoors on your lawn, <clears throat> you know that down here in the south, fescue does not grow very well. Um, you got to go up to about Kentucky. The climate there is just right, Kentucky fescue, and I grew up loving um, yard work. My dad was always in the yard, and, and I, my fir- one of my first jobs, other than selling newspaper subscriptions door-to-door at 12 years old, was cutting grass, and um, I remember my dad would have the yard. He would almost always, um, uh, what do you call that? I should know this, whenever you put the plugs in in the fall time, and then the pre-emergence, and then he would overseed in the spring, and just in time, and that fescue would come up, and it would be beautiful, green. You'd walk out there barefooted, and you felt like you were in Kentucky. My grandparents lived in Kentucky, and they had this fine green fescue grass that was just beautiful. It's hard to describe to those of you who don't care about grass, but it's fascinating. I just, oh, I... To this day, anytime we're traveling and I go to, we're on our way to Kentucky for some reason, maybe a family camp in Indiana, and sometimes we stop at a rest stop just over the Kentucky line out of Tennessee, and they have this nice Kentucky fescue. If something happens when you go from Tennessee to Kentucky, the grass is different. Check it out sometime. You're ever on I-65 going north, get off at the rest area, take your shoes off and walk in the Kentucky fescue. It's really a treat. It really is. Um, well, my dad would always work hard, and in the, in the wintertime, or, or he would actually grow rye, and so our lawn would be green in the wintertime. And then in the springtime, he would overseed it with Kentucky fescue, and bef- it would just be nice and lush and grass, and our water bill would be really high. And, he would, and, um, and then the summer months would come in Atlanta, 
and it would not rain for about two or three months. And they would start, you start to hear water restrictions. And they would start to tell you you couldn't water your grass on the Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but you could water your grass on Tuesday and Thursday. And boy, let me tell you, my dad took full opportunity on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That yard was watered. But inevitably, as the summer months and the heat would come upon Atlanta and the suburbs, there was no stopping it. No matter, it, it just, the grass would start to turn darker. They would lose that green spring luster, that green luster, and eventually it would just start to die out as the drought of summer would come. You would do your best to fight it. You'd do your best to fight it, but sure enough, come late July, early August, it would just be brown. It would start to just get brown. I wonder how it is with God's people. You know, I, the Bible talks about spiritual droughts. The Bible talks about a time where there was no rain in Elijah's day. The Bible talks about a time where Solomon dedicated the temple as a faithful Solomon. And he had prayed for wisdom and God gave him wisdom and he prayed one of the most beautiful prayers of the dedicatory service of the temple. And I'd like to read to you part of what Solomon mentioned there. You can read it in 1 Kings or you can read it in 2 Chronicles 6. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. I invite you to go there in your Bibles with me. 1 Kings chapter 8. Quite a bit of reading here. So if you're drowsy, have someone pinch you. 1 Kings chapter 8. Verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 1, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel under the king Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So they brought the very presence of God into their midst. That's a good idea, wouldn't you agree? Do we want to allow the presence of God to be in our midst? Is there a covenant that Jesus has made with the Father to make his presence possible amongst sinners like us? Yes. Now let's be clear, the way that sinners like us receive the presence of a holy God and in whom presence is a consuming fire that anything that's holding on to sin is consumed, we need to be covered in the blood of the Lamb. And we need to be forsaking our sins as we come into the presence of God. So just typologically a little bit of an aside there. But Solomon calls all the heads of the tribes, all the elders together to Jerusalem. He calls the Ark of the Covenant to be brought out of the city of David right there. Verse 2. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the Ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. Even those did the priests and the Levites bring up everything. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen. We know what those represent. The sacrifice of Jesus that could not be told nor numbered for the congregation. Verse 6. And the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle. And they were not seen without. And there they are unto this day. Hmm. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put in there at Oreb, 
when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of this cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Continuing on, verse 12. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in for how long? Forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and hath with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people, Israel, out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house, that my name might be therein. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David my father, Where is Israel? It was in thy heart to build a house unto my name. Thou didst well that it was in thy heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto thy name, unto my name. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spoke, that he spake. And I am risen up in the room of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And I have set there a place for the ark wherein is the covenant of the Lord which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So this is the context. And then Solomon prays the dedicatory thanksgiving prayer as he dedicates the temple. Now I want us to consider the temple of God today as we consider the words that we're about to read. And consider the temple in heaven that the book of Hebrews tells us about, that Jesus is our high priest. Not just any high priest, but a high priest that's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in all points like who? like we are, yet without sin. And so I want us to consider the temple in heaven, Christ Jesus, our sacrifice, the Lamb of God, now our high priest, ministering in our behalf in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And then I also want us to consider our bodies being the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. God dwelling in in us. So with that in mind, let's read Solomon's prayer of dedication and thanksgiving at the temple. Verses 22, we'll go to about 39. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath, who keeps covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. How much of their heart? May the Lord help us to not have divided hearts. Verse 24. Who hast kept with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him Thou spake also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. Is God's word authoritative? When God speaks and says this is the way it's going to be, this is going to happen, when God's prophetic word is put forth, is it accomplished? Is it ineffectual in any way? Does man need to prop up God's word as if it's somehow not capable in and of itself? Let's be clear. God 
doesn't so much need man as much as man needs God. And yet, wonder of wonders, it's God who is pursuing us more than man is pursuing him. Verse 25, Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spake unto thy servant David, my father. Solomon understood it. He was calling on the Lord, Lord, please let thy word be established. Let thy word be verified. May God help us to be that same type of a people. Lord, let thy word be established, not culture, not my ideas, not some ethnicity, not some national socialism. May thy word be established, not some political philosophy, not some sort of ideal or or idea that you have. Let thy word be verified. You know, that's the only thing that's going to last. People come and go. Generations come on the scene and then they die off. And nations rage against each other and they're so self-important and their whole politicizing and the process of trying to take over the whole global affair. And yet, it's the word of God that remains unshaken. Many a man has worn out their hammer on the anvil of truth. The word of God does not wear out. It's not frustrated by the stubbornness of man. It just continues on. And it will accomplish that which God has sent it forth to accomplish. Our transformation, the cleansing of our temple, and the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary as Christ manifests his character in his people, his very presence in our midst, in us. Solomon understood this. Let thy word be verified, which thou spake unto thy servant David, my my father. Verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Question mark. Behold, the heaven and heaven and of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prays before thee today. Solomon understood that the Lord is omnipotent, he's omniscient. The Lord can't be contained. And yet Solomon understood that even with this amazing truth of God's being, he still hearkens to the prayers, the cries of his people, his servants. Verse 29, Solomon continues, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said. My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people, Israel, when they shall pray toward this place and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and when thou hearest, forgive. Let me ask you, How important is it to pray? Steps to Christ has a whole chapter entitled The Privilege of Prayer. Do we recognize prayer as a privilege? Sometimes when we're so hungry, we might consider it an obligation. And we say it so fast with a mumbled in Jesus' name, amen, so we can hurry up and stuff our face. I'm speaking from my own experience. Prayer has been something that the Lord has continually tried to bring to me and say, Jeff, you need to pray more than you do. 
You need to pray more than you realize you need to pray. The position of being a suppliant. When you are asking someone for help, what kind of position does that put you in? Are you needy? Anybody here love being needy? In our culture today, we mock people who are needy. We speak of them in pejorative terms. Surely not us as a church. But the needy, and I understand we live in a culture of entitlement. And so some people's needs is artificial. And it's been planted in their minds that they can never do anything for themselves. But the position of prayer and supplication is one that says, I need help. And the person that doesn't pray to God Almighty is basically saying, I don't need your help in my life. In fact, I'm doing quite well on my own. No thank you. Whether or not that is explicitly spelled out, that is the message that heaven receives. I woke up one morning recently, and the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart, a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. Those who pray spasmodically will lose their hold on Jesus. I always pray first thing in the morning. But then the truth is, I go throughout my day and I got a list. And I'm doing things. And a good day is when I get a lot of my list done. And I don't know about you, some of you here might be list people. I see a few smiles. But I'll get tunnel vision on my list. And I'll be so focused on my list that I won't even pause to pray. Or when I pray, I'm praying that the Lord will help me accomplish my list. Not, Lord, do I need to take this off my list? Not, Lord, do you want me to just put this aside on my list and let it wait? You could call it obsessing, and that would be accurate. I get focused, I get tunnel vision, and so often I can live my life without supplication. I can mechanically pray in the morning first thing, I can pray before I go to bed, I can pray for my food, but oftentimes I can pray spasmodically, mechanically. I'm reminded here as Solomon is offering his prayer to the Lord God of how desperate I need to pray regularly to continually dedicate my temple, my body, to Jesus. We'll read verse 30 again. Hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people, Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hear, forgive. Isn't that good news? 1 John 2. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Aren't you glad for the advocate in Jesus Christ? A righteous man falls how many times according to Proverbs? Seven times, but he gets up seven times. A wicked man falls once, and he never gets back up. The reality is, you're going to fall. But let the advocate, Jesus Christ, pick you back up and forgive you. Keep going to him in prayer. And the Bible tells us that he will hear from heaven the humble heart, the humble prayer of his servants, and he will forgive them. That's good news. Verse 31 If any man trespass against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and do and judge thy servants. Condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head. It doesn't say go to court. It doesn't say sue each other. It says bring the matter before the Lord. 
Then thou hear in heaven and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. When thy people, Israel, verse 33, be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people, Israel. Does God always give his people victory? Not if, they're not, not if we're not meeting the prerequisites. If we're not cooperating with the Lord, I remember the story, you know about it, when the children of Israel were led into the promised land of Canaan, were they victorious over that big fortified city of Jericho? They were. Did they feel all high and mighty before they went up against Jericho? What did they feel like? Grasshoppers. The Bible says they felt like grasshoppers. The Bible does not call people to uh, self-grandiose ideas about themselves. The Bible calls people that feel like grasshoppers (laughs) and says, now go and do the impossible. And they say, huh? What? Jericho? Yeah, and do it with clay pots and, and march around and shout and you'll watch what happens. What? Yeah, the word of the Lord says it. I'm going to teach you to depend on my word. Huh? Yeah. And by the way, whenever you conquer the city, don't take anything to yourself. Don't take any of the booty of war. And did Achan listen to the word of God? Achan did not. And so one person in the midst of the camp can spoil the whole success of the camp. That's responsibility for me each of you and so they go up to war the battle against ai you know confident that the lord is going to give them the victory and does god give them the victory no ai routes them and you can imagine joshua's confusion like what's going on something's not right here and they find out it's Achan didn't allow god's word to be the authority of his life mocked it And Israel was doing nothing about it, but boy, when they found out about it, they had to deal with it, not in some pleasurable way, like, oh, we love doing this, but it had to be done. The Bible's very clear. Solomon says it here, verse 33, again, when thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy... Why would God's people, the followers of Almighty God, be smitten down by anyone? Now granted, there's been many a faithful man and woman that has been smitten down and God's allowed it to happen. How about what happened to the 40 million of the Inquisition? How about the 40 million of the Russian Orthodox that were slaughtered by Lenin? Not sure why we don't have a museum to them in Washington, D.C. You never hear about the Russian Orthodox. You never hear about the three million that the Ustashi slaughtered in Yugoslavia, the Protestants. Not sure why you never hear about the Protestants. Just saying. So there's many a people that have been faithful to God that have lost their life. I'll be clear on that. But Solomon is saying here, when thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee. Let me just be clear for the record. This is on the internet. I'm not saying anything about the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. I think it's horrible what Hitler did. You have to say this stuff now. You've got to overstate it because everybody's saying if you even intimate the slightest thing, you're an anti-Semite. I'm not. God loves the Jews. God loves the Russian Orthodox. He loves the the Slavic people that were slaughtered by the Ustashi. God loves everyone. So let me be clear. I got to say these things. We live in a world where the slightest intimation can say, look, look. When thy people, Israel, be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee. Why were they smitten down by the enemy? 
because they sinned against God. But notice what Solomon says. But they turn and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gave them, gave unto their fathers. Does God hear his people when they turn from their sins and they confess their sins to the Lord? Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that his mercy is brand new every morning, Lamentations 3? Why is it new every morning? Because we need it new and fresh every morning. Now you're not supposed to let your, you're not supposed to go to sleep with your wrath, right? You're supposed to bury the hatchet. You're supposed to like take care of whatever issues, right? That's easier said than done sometimes, right? Sometimes you're tempted just to say, pass the salt shaker for three days. And that's it. Just sort of like, mm, mm, mm. thank you. Don't let it happen. God's mercy is new every morning for a reason. It's because you need it. Don't always be thinking about your spouse that needs it. It's you that needs it. I'm glad that the Lord hears our prayers and we turn to him and we say, Lord, I'm desperate. I need you. We're always so prone to see the needs of others and we have a blind eye to our own need. Praise the Lord that when we see our need, we turn to him, confess our sins. He hears from heaven and he forgives. Verse 35. When heaven is shut up and there is how much rain? No rain because they have sinned against who? Against thee. If they pray toward this place, the temple, and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflicted them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and the people of Israel that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. I'm going to pause there. Are God's promises conditional? They are. I think it's no wonder that California incurred one of the greatest droughts in American history from 2012 to 2015. I've done a little bit of study, not a whole lot, but a little bit of study, a little, little bit about the history of California and modern politics and what's going on in that state, and it's shocking. Whoa, it's bad. But you know what, it's just, it's, it's coming to a state near you. Because this constitutional republic that afforded us Protestants the freedom of religion and scripture, we're told by inspiration, Ellen White says that one day every principle will be repudiated. Every principle of the constitution will be repudiated. We are a constitutional republic as a nation. And because of that, you and I can worship in freedom. Hallelujah! That's good news. But one day, those freedoms will be taken from us. How are we going to react? Well, to answer that question, I'd like us to consider Zechariah 10. Zechariah 10. In the book of Zechariah, this is some time after Solomon and his dedicatory service before the temple with the Ark of the Covenant there. Fast forward quite a few years. Zechariah is a prophet after Israel has turned their back on God. They've been taken into Babylonian captivity. They've lived there for 70 years, long enough for a whole generation to die. 70 years in Babylonian captivity. And then God said there's going to be a remnant that comes out of Babylon. Do you want to be a remnant that comes out of Babylon? 
I'm glad, so glad, that the Lord raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church, this movement to not be Babylon, but to be the remnant that keeps the commandments of God and has the faith of Jesus. In the book of Zechariah, the children of Israel, the, the, the promise to restore their homeland had already been given, and the remnant of Jews had already returned from Babylon, and they were expecting the promise of God to be fulfilled more quickly. Does that sound relevant? You know, we've been told that the Lord is coming soon. And he's going to take the remnant into their promised land. And there's many of us that thought, you know, man, why, why hasn't the Lord come yet? Well, there's a reason for that. The remnant of Jews, they had returned to Jerusalem and they were... Growing anxious, why hasn't the promise been fulfilled more rapidly that, that the homeland would be restored? And instead of Israel having the temple rebuilt, because the temple that Solomon had dedicated was now in shambles, it was in rubble. The glory, the presence of God had been taken out, Ichabod, because Israel had insisted on loving the world and the idols of the world. They turned their back on God and they quit turning back to God. They just walked away from him. And God said, okay, I'm going to honor your free will. Here's Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And that's sometime after they divided as a kingdom and they were fighting against each other. It was just a mess. Familiar. The Israelites that were living in, back in Jerusalem after the exile in Zechariah's day, they became discouraged because of the hardships that were in the land. They were under foreign rule and control. They're, they experienced economic hardships in the land. They were still waiting for the promise of God to be accomplished, that Jerusalem would be restored more fully and the temple would be rebuilt. And they quit working. They got so discouraged that they just quit working. That temple that Solomon had dedicated, the presence of God, the promise of prayer, his word, fast forward a few hundred years later, Israel is there in Jerusalem, the temple is in rubble, and they're discouraged. And they just decide to quit working. They're just, they're just, they're done. And the Lord raises up Zechariah the prophet to exhort the people to keep rebuilding the temple and to remind the people of the promises of God that the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is coming. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of full of an ass. This is Jesus. The Lord raises up Zechariah to try to exhort the people, encourage them. Jesus is coming. Don't quit working to rebuild the temple. And then he gives a series, he's given a series of visions what would take place. We even see in Zechariah, very fascinating to me, chapter 5, Zechariah sees a vision of a flying scroll signifying the word of God. And then he is shown an ephah where the bread or the flour is supposed to be for bread and the lead lid is taken off and he looks inside and there's a woman there and the angel tells him, this is wickedness. There's a woman in the bread basket. A woman represents a church. The bread represents the word of God. And, and Zechariah is seeing this vision. And then he lifts up his eyes, chapter 5, verse 9. And he sees two women come. Oh, a woman means a church. I wish I had time to get into this. They had wings like a stork. Stork is an unclean bird. A dove, representing the Holy Spirit, is a clean bird. Revelation 18 comes to mind. 
Then lifted I mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wings, the wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah with this wicked woman in the midst between earth and heaven. And then said I to the angel that talked with me, whether do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar, you could say in Babylon. And it shall be established and set there upon her own base. This is a prophecy of the Roman Catholic Church. Taking the place of the scripture. You don't have to pray to Jesus, you can pray to a priest. You don't receive righteousness by faith. You, if you don't have enough righteousness, then you can pray to the saints, and the saints will give you from the plethora of righteousness they have, and so you worship the saints. And on and on and on and on and on. But praise God, the Lord led his people out of that darkness, and we have the light of his word. You say, Pastor, how did you get from 1 Kings 8 to where you're at now? Hang in there. You're talking about green grass in Atlanta in the spring. Well, the Lord is trying to inspire his people through Zechariah the prophet, encourage them, don't quit working. Yes, I know there's hardship. Yes, it seems like the building is slow, and it seems like the temple rebuilding work is slow. And the temptation is to get discouraged. But don't. The Lord's people will be victorious. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. The Bible tells us, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. I smile at that. The great work of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not to close with the less of a manifestation of the power of God than when it began. Beloved, we're living in the very last days where the Bible prophesies that a greater amount of the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on God's people living just before his return. More even than the day at Pentecost when the church began. So the question is, why do we pray so little for it? Could it be that the devil is trying to do everything he can to keep you and I in drought? Do you think it's possible that the devil is trying to trip us up on any little technicality? Hey, I know that mankind only has a little bit of discretionary time. I'm going to come up with some sort of social media site that will just rob them of any bit of time they have. I'm not one that has arrived on this. I struggle as well. Did you know that the, that the software engineers of Facebook have now come out and said they intentionally designed the software to pray, not A-Y, E-Y, to pray on the weaknesses of humanity? That they actually understood psychologically how to best get people addicted to Facebook? In fact, many of the, uh, some of the software engineers have left the company because they're disgusted of what it's become. There's one mechanism or one um, thing where you can slide down on the Facebook front page or whatever, and it's like a slot machine. And they actually did that on purpose, understanding that it had the same, it, it, it simulated the slot machine, the one-armed bandit in Vegas. And, and people would like take their front page and they would push their finger down on their phone or their tablet and it would reshuffle every post and it would give new things. And it would be exciting because, oh, I got it. what's this person doing? And what are they posting? And oh, they're arguing about whatever and no one ever listens to any argument on Facebook. Why do they waste their time? Why do I? And... um. I believe that the devil is doing everything he can to arrest our attention and arrest our development. That any discretionary time we have that we could be praying 
and seeking the Lord with all of our heart and gathering strength and receiving the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, the devil's doing everything he can to just take all that time away from us to where we're just like, And it's scary when you read Christ Object Lessons, Ellen White's commentary on Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. Think about the, the servant that just buried his talents. She says the one talent that we all have is time. And she says the one thing that we'll have to give a strict account of is how we used our time. And I cry before you because I say, Lord God Almighty, have mercy on me. I don't want to lose your Holy Spirit. I need more of the Holy Spirit. Please peel me away from any of these artificial needs that the devil has concocted to arrest me and to keep me in drought in a place where my soul temple is empty and I got nothing to give. Because I'm not praying enough. I'm not seeking Jesus with all my heart. And I can think I'm doing ministry on social media, but the truth is, I lose track of time. But heaven doesn't. The recording angel, Walper spent this much time on social media today. Walper spent this much time in Bible study and prayer, visiting people, giving Bible studies. It's sobering, isn't it? Do you think the devil is quite satisfied to keep God's people in drought? Oh, he wants that so bad. He knows that Jesus is the fountain of living water. He knows that Jesus and his word will fill our famished, dry, broken souls. And so he's got all sorts of workers concocting all sorts of addictive things to take whatever discretionary time we have to keep us from Jesus. I tremble. This morning, I'm not embarrassed to tell you, I woke up early this morning, two, three o'clock in the morning, and I was praying, reading my Bible, I was convicted. And I just wept and cried. Lord, have mercy on me. <laughs> have mercy on me, Lord. I'm going to have to give an account of my time. Have I been a faithful pastor? Lord, I'm getting ready to leave and go to California. And as a pastor, you look back and you think, what could I have done better? Lord, I should have visited more. I should have done this better. I'm so, Lord... Help me. We can't get yesterday back. But we can live today well. There's a reason that his mercy is brand new every morning. It's because we need it. The problem with Laodicea is they don't even see their need for it. They're happy with their legal religion. And Jesus is standing at the door knocking they're happy with their rock concert, and Jesus is knocking at the door. They're happy with being critical of other people. There's going to be a latter rain. And we're told that it's going to pour out on God's people. And those who receive the early rain of the gospel and are converted will receive the latter rain. You see, the latter, the, the latter rain doesn't germinate the seed. It's the early rain that germinates the seed and the plant starts to grow. That's what conversion is. And, and we grow. Oh, I hope we grow. We grow. But sometimes it's a long summer and it gets really hot. And we start to dry up. But sink those roots into Christ Jesus, his living water, his word. The well is deep. 
The woman of Samaria didn't understand it. Well, oh, yeah, the well's deep. Where can you draw from? You have nothing. No, don't worry. Jesus knows how to get you living water. But at the end of time, we're living in it now. We're told that the showers of blessing are going to fall. The latter rain's going to fall. And it can be falling all around us and we don't know it. And we're missing out on it. Why? Because we're not converted day by day. And we spend more time we're, we're, there's going to be people, there's going to be millions of people losing out on eternity with Jesus Christ for this. I don't know that person. I know that person. They don't live that type of life. How do, yeah, great picture. Oh, oh, great picture. All these pictures of themselves. You take a picture of something else. Great, great. Oh, yeah, picture yourself. Picture yourself. Oh, okay, great. Argument. Oh, yeah, social. Oh, Oh yeah, got it. People are going to miss out on eternity for that drivel. Let it not be so with us. Maybe it's not Facebook for you. Maybe it's something entirely different. Maybe it's novels. You love going to your place and, and, and when you're stressed out, you pull out a novel and you read some, something romantic that makes you feel loved. Or maybe it's food. I don't know what it is, but the devil is doing everything he can to keep you and I in drought and dried up. And Jesus is saying, look, if you'll just turn to me, I know the way is hard. I know that it seems like the promise, the fulfillment of the promise is slack and it's slow and you're wondering, why are things like this? Don't get discouraged. Look to Jesus. Receive the early rain and the latter rain that he promises to pour out. Ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. It's time right now. The latter rain is now. We got 100,000 people in Papua New Guinea being baptized like that. We got a million people in India that have given their heart to Jesus, their seventh day Adventist. There's more seventh day Adventists in India today than there are in the United States. <laughs> and we didn't have hardly any seventh day Adventists in India 15 years ago. That's called latter rain, okay? And meanwhile, the church in the United States is plateaued and is even on the back slope of the bell curve. It's institutionalized and we're closing up churches left and right. And you got a bunch of Adventist churches wanting to turn the Adventist church into a mega church because they get more out of Willow Creek and Joel Olstein than they do the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. And so they bring in their cool guys with the music and everything, but that's not the Holy Spirit. And when the music stops, nothing changes. We're guilty in the conservative camp too. We have our issues. Let's be clear. Ask you of the Lord, rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone, grass in the field. I believe that heaven, Elamite has that vision of the narrow way and the chasm and they swing over on a rope into a field of grass. I believe it's going to be long fescue, fescue grass. I like to think they'd be barefoot oh, walking side by side with Jesus. I don't want to miss out on it for something goofy like this. Oh, I pray for you as my church family. I pray for me. Let's pray for each other. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as a people. Take away our love for this world. Please, Lord, help us to redeem the time. I can't get back yesterday. Just forget about it. But live today well. His mercy is brand new this morning. Receive it and then give it to others. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. If it's your response, Lord, I want the latter rain. I want the seasons of refreshing in this time. Lord, teach me to pray more. Help me to understand that I'm weak and needy and I'm a suppliant and, and you want me to be okay with that. If it's your desire, Lord, I need to pray more. Help me to have a regular prayer life. I invite you and, and, and help me to pray for the Holy Spirit and to receive the Holy Spirit. If that's your desire, I invite you to raise your hand. If it's, you can put your hand down now. If the Holy Spirit's convicting you that 
you have an addiction to social media or you have an addiction to something that is grieving the Holy Spirit away from you, if that is you, I'm gonna invite you to respond to the Holy Spirit silently just between you and God. The video camera doesn't need to pick this up, but Jesus knows your heart. I'm gonna invite you to respond to Jesus at this time with a, yes, Lord, I wanna surrender. Help me. Give me the victory. Jesus, we thank you that you hear from on high our prayers when we come to you. We thank you that you're not done rebuilding the temple in us. No temple over in Jerusalem. Us, Lord, you're rebuilding us. As you cleanse the heavenly sanctuary, you're cleansing your people. Oh, Lord, we live in a dry and thirsty land. We live in a world that is fraught with famine. The word of God is hard to be found in our culture. May we not be arrested in our development of becoming like Jesus by artificial needs. Oh Jesus, we come to you as your people asking you, pleading with you, give us the latter rain. Rain upon us, dear Lord, the Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, do this work in us. Manifest Jesus, your character in us, your people. Help us dispense with all self-sufficiency, all pride, all legal religion. May we allow you, your word, and the Holy Spirit to fully reign in our hearts. For Christ's sake, I pray this. Amen.